Hey everyone, I'm Kyle. Welcome back to the Best Wines Online Tasting Room. And, um, okay everyone, don't panic. What I'm doing right now, what I'm, what I'm, okay, yeah. Uh, this is, okay, everyone, just calm down. I just poured two glasses of delicious, ripe, beautiful California Chardonnay. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna drink it. It's gonna be good. You know why? Because the guy next to me, one of the kings of not, well, just to say Chardonnay would be doing Ed Spragia a disservice. Because this guy has pretty much done it all. Ed Spragia in the house. Ed, welcome. So um, okay, real quick, one of, the, one of the things we were reading, I was reading somewhere, um, First of all, uh, I mean this in the, in the nicest way, uh, I didn't think you were this old, but uh, one of the things that came through in one of the write-ups I was reading uh, talked about you having uh, worked at the Gamble Ranch, or knowing the vines, since 1976. That's the year I started at Behringer. Were you like four? I mean... No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I started when I was 26. 26. Holy crap. Holy crap. Um, I want to talk about Chardonnay today, if you're okay with that. I presume you're okay with that. Yeah. No, you want to... My two favorite wines on the planet are Chardonnay and Cabernet, and then I grew up drinking Zen, so. Yeah. It's okay to drink Chardonnay, right? It is absolutely okay. It's, it's the best wine we make. It's the best wine you make. In California. In California. And the French I hear make it too. Occasionally a decent one. Yeah. Why, why does California make such great Chardonnay? Well, we've been blessed with a climate and specifically in the North Coast, where we're um, basically a Mediterranean climate with knocking on this wood, um, no rain during from April till the end of October, mm. and we have a cold ocean. Mm. I mean, the ocean in the Pacific is versus the Atlantic, we're about 10 degrees colder than the Atlantic. Atlantic's around 65 degrees, we're at 52 degrees. Yeah. And so therefore, even if it's an 85, 90 degree day, that nighttime temperature fog comes in and it's 52 degrees at night. <laughs> so right now, like yesterday, it was 82 degrees towards the end of harvest, but just yeah, to give yeah. an example, and it was probably 47 last night. So all through the growing season, you, you and that's important because you get uh, coolness that retains the acidity in the grape at the same time, it slowly ripens the fruit and gets it to be, to use a very technical, t a technical, it's easy for me to say, to use a very technical term, it gets really yummy. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it makes a wine that tastes good. And that's kind of, um, I, I, I asked an old food writer, a guy named Robert Lawrence Balzer, yep, says, yep. how do you decide what's good in food? He says, it's gotta taste good. It's good. Bottom line, gotta taste good. It's gotta taste good. It could be a hamburger, it could be Roman Conti, it has to taste good. Yeah. Now we here are blessed with this opportunity to make Chardonnay taste really good. We yeah. got. Okay. And what, and, and what you're saying is Chardonnay grapes can get perfectly ripe and still have very good acidity. They can be structured, I mean, in a cooler climate, closer to like the ocean, like uh, the Sonoma Coast, region or the Russian River region mm -hmm. or the Carneros along the bay mm -hmm. or in our case we're along the Russian River they uh, the fog comes in it stays cold and produces more structural ones as you get farther away like our Gamble Ranch mm -hmm. versus our home ranch it's uh, a little bit rounder a little bit fatter a little bit bigger so I can hang more things onto it. I can mm -hmm. use new 100% new oak I can mm -hmm. leave it in barrels for two, almost two years right Versus most Chardonnays are bottled before the next harvest. Got it, got it. Now, now here's here's a, a silly question for you. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Could you make? Because um, you know, there's a trend towards less wood. There's a trend towards higher acid that we're seeing a little bit in, in Chardonnay today. You know, beyond the whole ABC thing, which is acumpucky, by the way. The whole concept of anything but Chardonnay should just be anybody thinks anything but Chardonnay should be tossed out. Now, okay, but. Here's the deal. With a vineyard like Gamble Ranch, could you make what we call like a Chablis style Chardonnay there? Or is, is it possible or would it not express what this could give based on where you're at? 
Uh, just to give you a little perspective and historical background, in the 70s, we made everything that way. Because yeah. these you know, guy I went worked for, a guy named Myron Nightingale, mm -hmm. and Louis Martini graduated from the School of Agriculture in 1941 when it was at Berkeley, before it moved to Davis. These guys came into the industry out of Prohibition where there were a lot of bad tanks. Right. Old cement tanks with the yeah. rebar still showing, <laughs> redwood that had redwood. bugs that got out of the hole in the, in the front and walked around at night. And, you know, and there were monster things that would just turn your wine. To making a clean white wine, when the Germans developed stainless steel refrigerated mm -hmm. tanks, mm -hmm. it was like a godsend. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them to put their wine in, stain in barrels. Oh man! Yeah, yeah. Louis Martini once said, "You want oak? Go buy the tree." <laughs> so we had to do a lot of experimentation of, of putting wines in barrels. And mm -hmm. what we used to do is ferment them really clean and then put them in a god in a barrel. Mm -hmm. And they were god awful wines. Yeah. In the early seventies. Later, when we started doing, you know, we started running around and I remember being at. Romani Conti and asking the vineyard man, the vineyard uh, manager, or the cellar manager, you know, how he made wine. He told us me everything about barrel fermentation, mm -hmm. lead stirring, aging in barrels, and he, I said, well, "Why do you tell me all this?" And he said, "No one ever asked." <laughs> <laughs> so I was I'm going, "Thank you." Wow. So I went home and tried it, and it worked. And, but in the colder climate, it. It, you have to be a little more careful because mm -hmm. it'll bury the wine because the mm -hmm. technique is strong. You yeast right. it, kind of like you make a bottle of fermented champagne. You mm -hmm. get this nutty, yeasty character. You get this richness, this really roundness that I, you know, you taste in their higher yeah. end, their Montrachet, mm -hmm. the Grand Cruz and Prima Cruz. Yeah. And so I really liked white burgundy, so I tried to make wine and never could. But mm -hmm. our, what we made, which... I have to jump on the soapbox. We need to make California wines. Yeah. And the vineyard will tell you what you can make. Right. Right. And, you know, you take a great, great Cabernet vineyard and you try to make rosé out of it. I mean, it's like taking a concert pianist and cutting four of their fingers off. You right. Know? Yeah. You get certain things and you should take it all. If Mother Nature give it, you take it. You take it. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people miss the point that sometimes Mother Nature doesn't give it so much in Burgundy. Night, it's a tough place. Yeah. It's cold. So in the colder vineyards, a lot of the colder climate do better with stainless steel fermentation, mm -hmm. no malolactic, which mm -hmm. evolves it and rounds it, the secondary fermentation. And you produce a really nice wine that's crisp and angular. And um, But I'm more a fan of the rounder, softer style. Right. And what you're saying, just like in Burgundy, Chardonnay has to have the nuts to go through this process. Right. It, right. Yeah. If you think about where those are grown, those are grown south of, of Burgundy, yeah. not where the Pinots are grown, but in a warmer climate. Yeah, yeah. Duh. That's, I never thought about it. Well, no one ever asked. <laughs> they actually, in a lot of dinners, they'll serve their Pinot first and then they'll go to the Chardonnay because it's a bigger wine. A bigger wine. Yeah, warmer type wine. It's got more depth, more strength. Have you, have you, um, have you, Futs with your winemaking over the years, you know, from have, have things changed a lot for you from you know, the early 90s? Like when you really started getting on the map, well, probably like early for Chardonnay, we're talking early 90s. Chardonnay, one of the things I did was I, I realized that, oh my gosh, I wish I'd put this block in the new barrels. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of looked at, we started making reserve in 1978. Mm -hmm. And we went to all the blocks over the 15 years or 12 years that we had been making reserve and looked at where we picked it because often I have, you know, I take, I had five types of barrels and I take each block and put it in each one barrels. Mm -hmm. And I bought maybe 30% new oak wood, so I put mm -hmm. a third in new, a third in one year old, and a third in two year old. Well, sometimes I wish I, that the stuff I put in two year old I'd put in new barrels because it was a big, rich wine and it could substantiate the flavors of the oak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we started picking those blocks and putting those exclusively in the new barrels. So mm -hmm. I, I was bad at about nine, 900, so I was really pleased. So making the reserve ended up being a luxury of, yeah. of picking and choosing the best slots I had and making a better wine. So that kind of 
grew out of that, that we kind of looked at that. And then all of a sudden I had the right wines in the right barrels. So we started stirring more and instead of once a month, we went to once a week. And mm -hmm. At Sprage, I do it. My son does it once a week for almost two years with the Gamble Ranch. Wow. That's a lot. I don't know anybody on the planet that does that. No, no. And, and Burgundy's doing less now, right? Because all scared of pre mox and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and that yeah. whole thing is going on over there, which different story for a different day. Another day. Another, <laughs> which we could spend like another hour talking about. The, um, I got the Home Ranch Chardonnay in my glass right now. And uh, delightful wines. It's 50% new wood on this? Yeah, Home Ranch is um, right along the... Dry Creek, mm -hmm. which is a tributary of the Russian River. And mm -hmm. the Russian River is known for its cold climate. I mean, there's iron horses out there making sparkling wine. But great Pinots, mm -hmm. Rochilles, my aunt happened to be into Rochilles, so I'm kind of backdoor related to, nice. to the Rochilles, though I he's not given me a Pinot yet. And I've Maybe you should work on that. Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> my trouble is I went from 13th on the waiting list to 23rd. It's, uh, it tells you what family. family. <laughs> I think I have to belly up with the money. <laughs> the, uh, but that the, the home ranch is right where the two come together. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of fog in the morning. Uh, it's right next to my Sauvignon Blanc vineyard. And it, it produces a, a more crisp wine. So mm -hmm. I backed off on the wood. And um, it's aged for a longer, a shorter amount of time, so it gets a shorter amount of stirring, about mm. 10 months. Yeah. It's bottled before the next harvest. And it's all French oak from people I've been buying for, from for over 25 years. I love the wine. It, it, fruity, bright, focused, classic. To me, what epitomizes California Chardonnay. Um, and again, I'm not apologizing for drinking this one bit. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to have another glass once we cut this. So, Ed Spragia, thank you for coming. What a sincere treat and pleasure it was having you here. Um, My pleasure. I love it when the rock stars show up, man. You crushed it today. I learned so much in the last eight minutes, as much as you guys did, actually. So, uh, bombs away. Keep making Chardonnay, dude. Keep crushing it. Thank you. All right, cheers.